Galligan. Gardeau. Here. Hall. Here. Healy. Hoffman. Here. Holloway. Here. Iono. Here. Kowalchin. LeBeau. Here. Lester. Here. Magnin. Here. Murata. Here. Osgood. Here. Payne. Here. Patel. Salemi. Salmonides. Sweezy. Taylor. Here. Torres. Here. Vecino. Here. Carrier. We have a quorum. Stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Public comment relative to agenda items. Uh, good evening. I'm the uh, president of the Kimberly Lane Water Association, and uh, you're hoping you're, to be emeritus soon. Your name and uh, name. Uh, and Scott Van Sicklin. I'm sorry. Um, I'm here to put a face on the Kimberly and Water Association petition you've already received. I'm not going to go over that again because I know that's gone on to the Water Authority, uh, but I just wanted to add a couple other things um, to that petition. Um, we have a letter of support from the Department of Health, State Department of Health, recommending that we go on that. I've got one now from the local town of Glassbury Department of Public Health mirroring that recommendation and I'm told we'll be receiving a consent degree from the state of Connecticut about the matter soon. Um, I know you guys get a lot of petitions about uh, hardship cases and things uh, of that nature. Um, because we're a community well, we're a little different. We have to meet all these re regulations and requirements that are really designed for bigger systems than ours. Um, and the state is really wanting to phase these out, well, you know, because they're just for 10 households to try to keep up with all these requirements and regulations, it's just not feasible at any thing. So that given the proximity of where we are to an existing line, about 200 feet, uh, and the short distance that we really are talking about, about 1,000 feet, um, they're strongly recommending that we address MDC uh, is going on that. And, and we have looked at trying to put additional or private wells in, but with the ledge in the area, that becomes a problem with sanitary, getting that in in uh, other environmental things that are going on in that area. So um, that's why I'm here, just to put a face on who we are and who I am, and uh, hopefully we can work forward on this. Thank you, sir. We're, we'll be referring it this evening to the Water Bureau, who will have a public hearing on it. Thank you. Further comment? Good evening, Commissioner. My name is David Silverstone. I'm the independent consumer advocate just like to speak briefly on two items on your agenda. The first is item 10, the long range integrated plan. Uh, the consumer advocate supports this plan based on the information available to date at several briefings over the last couple of months. Uh, that's not to say it is perfect. Uh, and there is additional information I'd like to see uh, when it becomes available uh, in certain areas. But overall, this is absolutely a step in the right direction. Uh, and I urge you to uh, take action tonight to continue this uh, plan forward. Um, there was discussion earlier today about the overtime on uh, main breaks and sewer breaks. And I would hate that 10 or 15 years from now, there's another group of people, or maybe the same group of people, talking about, I wish something had been done 10 or 15 years ago. So I would urge you to take favorable action on that tonight. The second item is item nine on your agenda, and that's the uh, consumer advocates meeting for, scheduled for October 10th in the training center at 7 p.m. That's a hearing required, that's a meeting required by statute, uh, Public Act 17-1. And the agenda for that is gonna be for me to give a summary of my activities to date, uh, and to listen to consumers and hear what they have to say. Time. So that's the purpose of that meeting. That's why it was set up. You are all welcome to attend if you choose to. Thank you. That's October 10th, 2018 at 7 p.
p.m. Correct and at the, the training center. The training center, which at, is down uh, on. Uh, I think it's Maximum a, Road. Correct. Maximum. Correct. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Further comment. Sure. Um, if if we can't attend that, uh, will there be minutes so that we could uh, hear what the. Uh, uh, consumer advocate has to say to the public and um, and what the public has to say at the meeting? Uh, that's a good question. There uh, there will certainly be minutes taken whether... Do uh, you want us to take minutes? To record it. Yeah, I, I'm a little reluctant to require a recording of that, uh, but I could be persuaded to do that. I, I'm just reluctant because I want people to have freedom to speak and to speak freely, and some people might be inhibited. Certainly my remarks, I'm happy to record. Uh, I'm leery of recording remarks from the public because they may choose not to have those recorded. And the goal here is to have as full and open a discussion as possible. So if that would satisfy the commissioner, we could certainly arrange to have my remarks recorded, if that would be helpful. I was just asking a question. Sure. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Judy Allen, West Hartford. Um, first, I want to say uh, that I, too, am definitely in favor of the integrated plan. Um, if I can, uh, I'm not going to quote, but... Um, uh, in a previous meeting, I believe Scott put it this way, that the cost may still be high, but we are getting more for our money. And I am very much wanting us to see an improvement in our infrastructure as soon as possible. I do have a couple questions. Um, understanding the impacts to customers. So if I'm understanding correctly, over time, I will still end up paying the same for my clean water project, or my grandchildren will, um, no matter if an integrated plan is used or not. My savings come in the form of a reduction in my property taxes to keep the ad valorem charges lower. That's the question. Um, I still don't really understand how that $3 fat flat fee is calculated, but would this go away in an integrated plan since the ad valorem costs will be lowered or contained? Um, and right now, the financing of sewers involves the non-municipal tax exempt fee. Since there will continue to be an ad valorem tax, I'm assuming that fee would still remain. Would the method for calculating the rate change in any way? Um, and I have questions about financing, um, because I don't understand what kind of deep funds can be used for which kinds of projects. For example, if a, if a project had to do with like a pump station or something that doesn't directly impact the goals of the Clean Water Project, can deep funds be used to finance that? Um, and I have concerns about whether that kind of funding would be available on out into the future. And one last thing, I understand that there's a vote, several votes happening on the plan of, of a final draft plan in November, um, and meetings with the town and a public comment, and then will the board be voting again in December for the <coughs> final, final uh, plan that goes to D. Thank you. Further comment? Not uh, the uh, comment period is closed. <coughs> Approval of the minutes, uh, meeting of September the 5th, 2018. Is there a motion to adopt? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any additions or deletions? Being there no additions or deletions, all those in favor of the minutes as stated, please signify by saying aye. <coughs> aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Andy? Okay. Um, item six, report from the district chairman regarding uh, 
I do. When should we? It makes some sense to take this up last because it's going to be an executive session of the board. Yeah, but let's get. You got people here, so let's get. Well, I'm going to ask that we take this up at the end of the because it's going to require an executive session. That's relative to the negotiations that are going on between Deep and the MDC on the leachate. Uh, so I think it's better to get the business out of the way. We'll come back in the last, if there's no objection. Uh, and we'll, the last issue we'll take up will be the executive uh, session relative to that negotiation. No objection. We'll move on to uh, item seven, report from the chief executive officer. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the interest of time, we have a lot to go over tonight, so I'm going to try and make my uh, comments brief. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, we were invited, uh, I was uh, afforded the opportunity to represent the MDC at Congressman Larson's uh, forum. We have, you have, all have a packet of news clips uh, that are here, and you might have seen it. Uh, Congressman Larson has been looking to get uh, federal funding to support the viaduct uh, a replacement, uh, approximately 10 to 15 billion dollars versus the four to eight billion dollars that DOT is planning to renovate the existing viaduct here in Hartford. So we were afforded the opportunity to present uh, our tunnel project, which is really more so to talk about the the uh, the similarity of our uh, system and our technology with the tunneling uh, that Seattle had done uh, for their two-mile uh, transportation tunnel. Uh, was ve very well received, um, and we were appreciative to be there. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, we'll be uh, on the agenda is the affordability uh, component of the integrated plan tonight that uh, <coughs> Joe uh, Liliberty will be presenting to us. Um, source to sea cleanup. Uh, we've had uh, more than 18 consecutive years. Uh, uh, Julie and Nick both did an outstanding job. Uh, we actually had uh, Commissioner Adel, Commissioner Salemi, the mayor, the new mayor of uh, Wethersfield, and town council members um, uh, attend. Uh, we had a number of uh, 100, 100 or so uh, volunteers, uh, and it was a great success. So we thank all of them uh, for all their efforts. Um, skipping through, um, we have uh, met, as I mentioned at our last meeting, uh, working with uh, Commissioner Magnin on a speakers bureau to help educate and uh, to get utilize the commissioners to speak on behalf of the MDC at specific events. We'll be working with her to identify issues. We'll be also needing to identify a media consultant to support the uh, existing staff and working with them to develop uh, the issues that our staff will address versus what our media consultants will address. Um, we'll be providing uh, public speaking training to anyone who would wish to have it. There is an article, and I mentioned this a while back, um, there is an article uh, regarding the uh, Rocky Hill, town of Rocky Hill, and their wishes, the town's wishes, to utilize the soil from the tunnel to fill the old landfill in Rocky Hill. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we have really no uh, ability to engage the parties. We have let our contractor know that there is an opportunity to bring soil to this landfill. There's approximately 900,000 uh, tons of material that will come out of that landfill. The landfill needs approximately half of that for their closure procedure with uh, the state of Connecticut deep. We, we have no understanding of what the financial discussions are, only that there's not a lot of discussions going on. The town really would like this to happen, uh, but it's really between the contractor and the owner of the landfill, and that's all we really can do. Um, and so we're not sure what will happen, but the contractor in the town are working, I'm sorry, the owner of the landfill in the town are working on the issues associated with filling, fulfilling the permit <clears throat> from D. Um, the, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the finance department, uh, we do have um, um, a, uh, new comptroller, uh, and uh, I know a lot of you have not had a chance to meet her. She comes with 20 years experience. Uh, she is a CPA. Karen Blaze. Karen, could you please stand up? A lot of people don't even know who you are. Uh, Karen uh, 
has been working diligently uh, with, with finance, uh, with John and with Cone Resnick. Uh, so we're very happy to have her. We also have uh, recommendations from Cone's uh, report. They have recommended that we move forward uh, immediately with uh, hiring the manager of budget and analysis. That position was posted. We received about 35 applicants, and we're going through that process as we speak. Um, as I mentioned, over the next eight weeks, Cone Resnick will be working with John and Finance Department to help develop internal controls and develop assessments of procedures and policies and develop new ones as required. Um, I mentioned uh, over the last couple of uh, months talking about the need uh, to analyze the existing contract between the MDC and the Army Corps of Engineers as it relates to building of Colebrook Reservoir. We have been in discussions internally to say uh, the Colebrook Reservoir was built in 1967 and the goal of that reservoir is really to act solely as a, um, as a flood control. That flood control operations completely contradicts uh, a reservoir drinking water system. You're trying to store the water and uh, an Army Corps dam is releasing water, anticipations of major floods throughout the spring. So the way in which it operates, uh, as we saw in the summer of 16, um, there's no water at the end of the day after a drought. You release the water in the spring, if no water comes, we're continuing to release a minimum of 50 CFS, which is approximately 80 MGD, uh, I'm sorry, 32 MGD. So we're releasing that water even when water's not coming in. The question becomes, the contract for the Army Corps ends, the, the last debt service payment ends in 2019. We'll be budgeting that here. Uh, it's $204,000. Uh, in 2018, we, we expended uh, $680,000 in our maintenance contract. So the question becomes, if there is no water at the end of the day in a drought for our emergency drinking water, uh, we own about 13 billion gallons of water behind the Colbert Dam. What really is the purpose of that contract? And do we have the ability to even get out of that contract? Um, I believe, I, I would talk for our council, I think we believe that the, 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 the contract defines the project. The, project, the end of the project is the end of the debt service of the contract. Uh, we're going through a life cycle right now for the hydro. So we have hydro there. We have hydro at uh, Colebrook and at Goodwin. We make about a million dollars a year average. Um, about uh, a third of that is, is at Colebrook, but we need a, uh, at least a $2 million improvement over the next uh, five years. So our life cycle is not complete yet, but we do believe that the life cycle may not uh, benefit the MDC in terms of the long-term payback. And the question becomes the age of the, the, the infrastructure uh, and the future responsibility of any capital improvements in that dam, do we or should we continue with that agreement? So um, in your packet, uh, what we're suggesting is um, uh, we're responsible to release a certain amount of water at the Goodwin Dam, which is approximately a mile downstream of the Colbrook Dam. Our responsibilities solely are there, riparian and, um, and our minimum street flows under the wild and scenic. So we can continue to meet our obligations at the face of the Goodwin Dam without having the Colebrook Dam water. The challenge is, is that the way in which the water, we call it the flow regime, the way in which we release water right now is you're trying to get rid of the maximums and the minimums, and you're trying to create an average flow uh, to the river to sustain the aquatic life that, or, or the recreation that the, the state uh, is, is, is uh, supportive of. Ironically, uh, we have said in the stream flow um, discussions with the state water plan, we have said that the state would call these rivers impaired streams because you built a dam. Uh, what I have suggested and we have suggested, the MDC has suggested, is that the river isn't impaired prior to the dam being built uh, the Goodwin Dam built in 1960, the, the water flow in that river, natural flow, was 25 CFS. 
and we built the dam, and now we're discharging a minimum of 50 CFS. But remember, the intent of that dam system was to be an emergency drinking water source. So ironically, there's an article, and I'm not going to read it to everybody, but I wish you would take the time to read it. And it's very small print, and I don't know if I can even read it here. But there are, um, uh, this is, <laughs> I've got my glasses on, I still can't read it. The, uh, the important point of this is the Army Corps did a 11-year, uh, a, a $2.6 million study. Uh, and what they are saying is, is that the natural state is act of a river is actually better uh, than having the dams. The rivers are intended to flood. There's a lot of aquatic life and vegetation that grows when you have um, natural flooding and you create um, wider banks, you create more vegetation. Um, the natural uh, fish that were in these rivers were um, American chad and, uh, and, and what has been happening is deep stream flow regulations have been really forcing us to put more water in the river, more colder water in the river, which has allowed uh, invasive species to grow. And so, again, without getting into the details, it's just this article supports what we're actually proposing to do with the Army Corps. So we met with the Army Corps uh, on the 6th of September, and what they basically said was, um, what you're proposing to basically change the flow regime, uh, not release the water from the Colebrook Reservoir, and allow the Army Corps to release that water as part of their um, flood control uh, regime would actually make it easier for them, and it would make it easier for them to comply with the intent of this article. So um, we are working with them. We have to work with DEEP. We have to work with the Wild and Scenic. Uh, the Army Corps is actually giving us um, a flow regime that we can analyze to see how would they operate at the Colebrook if we were not there. We did not need to, uh, uh, to manage the flow as it relates to uh, repairing rights at that location or at, uh, for, the, for the hydro. So we're working on those details. Uh, we don't have an answer yet, but I just wanted to give you an update on that. Um, and then I hate to go into uh, any more of this because there's a lot here, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to answer those. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Any, any questions of the Chief Executive Officer? Just one quick question. Uh, Ski Sundown was working on a new uh, diversion plan. Is there anything updated on that? Uh, and that was for additional water sales, wasn't it? Raw water sales. Yes, it was. And I, uh, Susan, can you give me a quick update? <laughs> I believe we've, we've got a draft or the final. We've got condition. It's a conditional approvement. They've given them. I think it, we did get the final one in. It's got some conditions on there, so they'll be starting to build that connection. Great. Thank you, Sue. And then the only other question was: uh, uh, in January, there was a lot of major uh, leaks. Uh, last January, um, 10 million gallons of loss, 48 different properties. Was that finalized? Where we found all or majority of those leaks? Yes. Uh, well, I wouldn't say the, uh, all of them, but what, what, what we did do as part of that exercise is we, we basically, um, as we talked about in January, we shut off a number of main uh, transmission lines to identify leaks. And what we did was we actually found multiple leaks. Uh, we found uh, uh, on the bridge uh, in East Hartford uh, uh, a 12-inch water main leaking uh, profusely um, under the bridge at Pickin Street, I believe it's Pickin Street. Uh, so there's a number of those, found a, a few leaking uh, uh, over here in Hartford on, uh, under the bridges. So we found a lot of those leaks associated with the investigation we did in January. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman? But, okay. Yeah. Um, there was also a, a leak in, in Brewer Street in East Hartford. Um, was that also a part of it, and was it fully resolved, or was that part of the issue? Um, no, uh, Brewer Street was uh, uh, just a, uh, 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 a water main break. It had nothing to do with the January event, but Brewer Street was uh, this past month. Is that the one you're referring to? I think to? it happened in, around August. Yes, it was j just this past month is uh, when that uh, Brewer Street was, was 
early September, right? Five weeks, five weeks ago, five yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, but, uh, but um, so, Scott, in in the discussion with the the Army Corps, um, and uh, so there, for those of you who've never been up there, there's two reservoirs, one on top of another. There's Colebrook and Goodwin, and uh, the the dams are sort of on top of each other too. But when the the Goodwin Dam was built by the MDC, that's our dam, and uh, Colebrook was built by the Army Corps. So when we built that dam, we also uh, at at the uh, where the overflow is, where the spillway is, there's a tunnel that was started, that was put there to deliver water uh, to the Bar Campstead Reservoir from the Goodwin Reservoir, Colebrook and Goodwin Reservoirs. Um, should there be any need at some point in the future to move water, for the, the, actually, the uh, Colebrook Reservoir and Goodwin Reservoir are at a higher elevation than Bar Campstead, so the water would go downhill from from there to then that be pumped it goes downhill to Bar Campstead. Am I <coughs> correct about that? Yeah. I, yeah. So is the possibility of doing that like in, in sort of like out of the question or is there a point that at which we can count on that to to you know to deliver water in, in a drought at some point uh, if we needed to add water to, to uh, Bar Campstead and uh, I know originally it was planned to be a tunnel, but there's certainly ways to bring it above ground and you know, pipe it to the reservoir and everything, which would cost a lot less. But uh, is there anything still in the discussions with the Army Corps uh, or DEEP about the possibility of using that? So, um, so, the, so as you mentioned, Commissioner, Goodwin was built in 1960 by the MDC. Well, it was planned in the 40s, and the plan was it to be 6 billion gallons of water, and then 1955 flood hit. And the Army Corps obviously needed to build um, flood control structures throughout uh, the, the, uh, the watershed. And so when they decided to do that, they cut our 6 billion gallon uh, reservoir in half. And uh, so it became a 3 billion gallon reservoir. And then they gave us the other three, quote, in back of the Colebrook, plus they gave us another 10. As you remember, in our, the pictures that we had in, in August of 2016, Colebrook Reservoir was a mud puddle. So can you imagine spending the funds to build a tunnel to Bar Campstead when when you need the water, it's not, there's nothing there to take. So um, that's the challenge is that the, the idea and the concept was correct, but the Army Corps Dam really changed forever the way in which we are allowed to use our water just because of the nature of how they release the water. Our dam is only so big, and if they're releasing, uh, you know, tens of um, uh, billions of gallons of water, we can only catch three, three of it. So we can't store it. There's no other way to, to re re use it. The time in which we need the water is drought. During the springtime, um, Bar Campstead and Nipog are full. So like today, even today in September, um, with all the rain we've received, we don't need any more water uh, to be diverted from Goodwin. The other, the other issue is, um, although Goodwin is identified in our water supply plan as an emergency drinking water source, we would actually need a diversion permit from deep to actually use that as a drinking water source. Um, so really, it becomes a question of, we can operate the Goodwin Dam as required under our charter and under uh, the Wild and Scenic, I believe, mm -hmm. that um, as long as we release what we have to release, the 50 CFS and the riparian rights to the river. Now, if you would say pick a round number, four to five million dollars to operate that system, including another um, Two million dollars to upgrade the hydro at at Colebrook. Um, it only costs us two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year if we don't meet the repair and right release of twenty one billion CCF. So uh, gallons, sorry. So so um, what's is it? What's the worth of that structure at Colebrook if we can meet the goal and and requirement of of repairing for two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year? when we're spending all this money, and, and if the reason was because we had uh, 13 billion gallons of water in an emergency for drinking water, then I would suggest that's worth it. But we've seen in the drought, 
the water isn't there because the way in which the Army Corps releases it. So that really becomes the crux of, of the argument is what are we actually benefiting from? Uh, now, the Army Corps, in our meeting, they suggested that it would actually be easier for them to operate their requirements without us being there. Um, and um, so there's a lot of things for us to do, and they're, they're going to they're gonna have to study. We worry about the impacts downstream of our dam as part of our requirements. They're worried about downstream and upstream. They have other issues they have to worry about upstream as well, commitments they've made. So it actually would make the, their lives a little easier in meeting well, those the, requirements. The point was, as you said, we're, it's costing us a considerable amount of money. And the, the benefit is not necessarily to the MDC, but to right. the, the surrounding areas. So. Further questions? Chairman? So just more succinctly, the cost of this is being borne by the eight member towns through the ad valorem. Right. And what we're doing is providing recreation for all of New England, for people fishing by creating this. So the, the cost is actually is the built rate. into the water rate. The water rate. So okay. it's uh, uh, but the, uh, the the but you're right. The cost is being borne by the MDC customers as part of the water rate. The challenge that we have is, and I, and I asked this question of the Army Corps staff is, um, what is are there f potential future uh, improvements that need to occur on the dam, uh, and the answer is yes. And our agreement says that we pay 33% of that. So our challenge is uh, 2019 is the year to decide whether or not the MDC wants to continue on with this agreement because, again, the, the last payment for the definition of the project is 2019 payment. Further questions? Okay. Um, report from District Council, item eight. No report, Mr. Chairman. No report. <coughs> Nine, announcement of the Consumer Advocate Public Forum, October the 10th, 2018, at 7 p.m. at the Education Center on Maxim Road in Hartford. <coughs> Getting a three for one tonight. Um, Item 10, consideration and potential action regarding approval of the integrated plan. Uh, recommended action, receive the report and adopt the resolution. Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved and seconded uh, for the purpose of explanation. Um, Joe LaLiberty uh, will yield the floor to. Joe, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Behind us. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to put a uh, self-imposed deadline on myself, uh, about a half an hour. Um, you have the slides in front of you. I know you all would like it to go faster, but there are 40 slides. I'm going to try to go very, very fast through the first 20 slides that you've seen before. Do I have to stay? Well, what we are going to focus on is then, you, all of you have seen the technical components of this <laughs> numerous times. This really is focused on the financial affordability issues that we have to address uh, and so Joe is going to skim over the, the technical piece. All right, 25 minutes. 25 minutes, right. we have a deal? And, uh, and then we'll, go, we'll hit the, the most important part of this is really a question that was asked in the public hearing, uh, the public comment period, and that's really the crux of this is that what does it cost the customers between what we're doing today versus an integrated plan? Okay, okay. so you have the slides in front of you. Uh, the, the second slide is the acronyms. Uh, if I say something or if you see something in the slides, go to here and you can uh, and see what that means. Uh, the agenda for items one and two, I'm going to go over very quick. That's the background that I actually went over last month when I was here. I'm going to spend a little more time on three and four, which is the affordability analysis, and then, of course, the next steps. You all know that we have the next long-term control plan update is due in two th uh, December uh, 31st of this year. <laughs> this is the prior plan. Um, this was the plan from 2014. You've seen this before where it had the, the tunnel that went up to North Hartford referred to as the North Tunnel. That's what we currently are under consent order with the long-term control plan to build. This slide uh, I've presented to you a few times. This is what I'm going to update today. This is what I had shown in the past. It's from 2014. 
It's important because back then we were looking at the affordability analysis and its impact on Hartford and the MDC towns. 2%, what I have circled there, is what the EPA considers affordable. Anything over 2% is considered high burden. And so back at that time, we had said that Hartford was projected to be over 2% uh, at this time. That's going to get updated today. Also important from the power plan, this is from the 2015 public hearing. This is the special sewer service charge. And in the 2015 public hearing, we had talked about how the special sewer service charge peak was going to be reduced from just under $6 to just under $5. And we were doing that by extending out the program to 20, from 2021 to 2026. At that time, we had said that the peak would be uh, five, uh, $4, well, just under $5. After, after we had done the public hearing, we extended the schedule out again from 2026 to 2029. The reason for doing that was because the South Tunnel was going on and tried to delay doing the, the BODR for the North Tunnel. As a result of that, the Clean Water Project charge uh, peak was estimated to be $5.30, which should be a number that you are familiar with. This is just the, uh, the overview of where you are to date. We're all doing a great job. You've already reduced 50% of your CSOs, which is outstanding. Save the Sound just released a report uh, last week saying that they've noticed improvement to the Long Island Sound, which is what this is all about. Uh, so that's, that's great news, that the money is achieving the goal and it's actually having benefit to Long Island Sound. This is the Hartford Wastewater Treatment Plant showing what the nitrogen reduction has been, the nitrogen discharge to the Connecticut River. Uh, the bars on the left are, you know, before the Clean Water Project started. The bars on the right, you know, move towards today. And you can see the amount of nitrogen has been reduced. So the money we've spent at the plant reduced the nitrogen and improved the Connecticut River and Long Island Sound. The high points of the uh, technical plan. Um, so this is different than what we had done in the past, where in the past we were just strictly looking at a CSO long-term control plan. <coughs> This is from guidance from EPA from 2012, where they allow an integrated plan that allows you to consider all of your infrastructure needs, not just the CSO plan. And so what you're looking at today that we're presenting is encompass of all of the sewer collection system, not just the CSO uh, work. I had walked through this the last meeting, talking about that we had a number of meetings with all of uh, different uh, district uh, employees of all, all ranges. Uh, DEP was in a number of them. We developed a, the entire needs for the sewer collection system and then ranked all the projects with DEP so that we had a comprehensive list of all the things that needed to be done, CSO and, and, and else, elsewise. I've walked through this slide a number of times. Basically, there's three volumes that wind up getting submitted to DEP. Volume one on the top is the needs assessment. That's what you would need to do regardless of your CSO long-term control plan. Volume two on the bottom is your CSO long-term control plan. What we're looking for is projects in the middle that address both a need and a CSO solution. All, both of those feed into what is volume three, which is the actual integrated plan that takes into account the affordability and the schedule, which is what we'll be talking about today. Joe, if I can just use this slide to answer one of the public comments. So uh, under volume three, uh, integrated plan, um, there's going to be projects that meet the requirement um, to comply with the consent order consent decree that are integrated and those will be paid for by the state and by the funding provided by the clean water fund there'll, there'll be projects that are up in the top buckets that are also part of the integrated process but they might be a pump station for example in Bloomfield that has will not be part of any funding for the clean water project but it still is it, it's part of the integration process so if, hopefully that answered that question. The baseline assumption is to try to address the aging uh, failing infrastructure, uh, which is what I just talked about through uh, television inspection of the existing sewer system. We've already identified $450 million worth of need for improvements to the sewer system. And as Scott was, as Mr. Jellison was just mentioning, what we're looking at is dual benefit projects such as sewer rehabilitation that repairs the infrastructure while also addressing combined sewer overflows by reducing the flow that gets into the combined sewer system. All of this will be coordinated with water main infrastructure improvements. I'll primarily be focused on the sewer, but clearly there's another half of the equation that is the water system that was talked about earlier today and the fact that it's failing. Projects would be coordinated where the water main would be done with the sewer separation and the sewer on the street at the same time. Uh, this table I explained at the last board meeting. Um, 
It's a lot to take in if it's the first time you've seen it, but basically what we're looking to do is to recommend a significant portion of the sewer system in both Hartford and West Hartford, which is your oldest and leakiest sewer system. Uh, that's where the predominant uh, rehabilitation recommendations are coming from. At the end result, when we're done with the projects that we have rated and, and put forward, uh, uh, as well as other projects, we would have rehabilitated 72% of the Hartford system and 79% of the West Hartford system, which is significant. And on the right-hand side, you see the average age of the sewer system. Before we started, for example, Hartford was 74 years old. If we continued to ignore the system, it would go up to 107 years old over the time period of building that north tunnel. With our plan that we're recommending, the average age of how old the sewer system is will go down to 35 years by implementing all this rehabilitation projects. Very, very substantial. These are the two plans that I walked through at the last board meeting, the technical plans. Um, basically, the, the one on the left is the all tunnel plan, similar to your 2014 update. The route of the tunnel looks a little different because we've updated it uh, with new information. And the tunnel on the right is the proposed integrated plan that includes sewer separation uh, in the northern Hartford while also building the downtown tunnel uh, for downtown Hartford uh, to, that connects over to the south tunnel. I walked through uh, at that last meeting the benefits uh, of each, uh, comparing them. The North Tunnel Plan is the cheapest solely CSO plan. If you just were looking at to address CSOs with blindfolders on and not considering all of your infrastructure that's failing, you know, on, seemingly on a weekly basis. Whereas the project on the right, although it's more expensive, $350 million, it's not apples and apples because it's addressing your aging infrastructure. So the money that's being spent is being spent on, on renewing the system. Uh, obviously, the left is one large project, and on the right are projects that can be phased over time and show progress over time. And it is integrated planning. Um, one question I had gotten in the past is we were doing separation, and then we moved away from it, and now we're moving back towards it. Um, we moved away from it specifically in the Franklin Avenue area uh, where uh, results wound up showing that we actually were a little uh, less effective than we thought we would be. Uh, whereas in the Granby area in North Hartford where we are recommending this sewer separation, we've done flow metering and we found out that we actually were very successful in taking, getting the infiltration and inflow, uh, the catch basins and the flow into the sewer system out. So we're pretty confident that we'll, uh, we'll be able to achieve what we need to in the North, Hart North Hartford area. Okay, so that was the quick background. Now we're going to jump into the affordability analysis and uh, with the 2018 projections. I already mentioned the median household income. Um, uh, the, the basis of what is considered affordable by EPA is 2% uh, threshold. Anything over that is considered high burden. Um, they look at a single family uh, customer, um, basically a dwelling. Um, and uh, we, in the current projections, they looked at, we've looked at the actual water that was being sold and consumed. So the actual water sales on the clean water charge is 16.1 million CCF, and the average per dwelling um, is approximately 70 CCF. And that's going to be important, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, and we modified the income uh, based on current data. Uh, and we have three scenarios on this slide that walk through the current existing program because we want to use that as a baseline for comparing against the proposed program. Bullet one is the existing program, which was the original 2014 plan that I showed up front in the presentation. It was required uh, by DEP for that plan to be completed by 2029. That represents the $5.30 on the clean water charge that I mentioned earlier. In order to have achieved that program on that schedule, we would have needed to have started the North Tunnel BODR probably last year or if not the year before. We haven't started it because we delayed it for good reason because we were moving towards the integrated plan and DEP is aware of that. So what bullet two is, is the realistic current program. If we did or if DEP did force you to go forward with the all tunnel plan, we realistically couldn't finish it by 2029. We could finish it by 2032. So that's going to have a separate clean water charge peak estimated in order to complete the current plan as currently envisioned. And then the last bullet is the same plan. However, it is going to show you what would happen if we didn't get any clean water fund grants and loans. So here these are on a slide showing the clean water charge with the current program, the 530, represents what it would be if you completed everything by 2029 as required by your current consent order. The $6.20 line is what is represented by 
how you could actually feasibly complete that, which is 2032. We assume that we would be starting the BODR for the North Tunnel in 2020 if that was the case. And then the top line, the scary top line, is the if you uh, did not continue to get the 50% grants for CSO projects and the, uh, and the Clean Water Fund loan. So uh, the top line obviously is extremely important uh, to drive home that, that continuing to get the grants and loans from the state is very important. And we've assumed that you will continue to get those grants. But clearly, if there ever was a time when that didn't occur, the whole program would have to be revisited again. And Joe, before you leave this slide, this is very important because when we, as the board remembers, uh, when we wanted to sign the contract for the actual tunnel, contract two, there's five contracts within the tunnel contract. The contract two, which is the major $270 million, um, we wanted DEEP to assure us that the remaining contracts, three, four, and five, pump station and two consolidation tunnels, uh, would also receive the same grant that we received for the tunnel, which is 48%. Uh, they would not guarantee that, could not guarantee that in writing. They said so in writing. Uh, in January, this coming January 2019, we're planning to bid one of the consolidation tunnels for the new, new uh, Newington, West Hartford area. And we will know then whether or not we actually receive the 48% grant that we're expecting. If we do not receive the 48% grant for that project, we're coming back to the board and we're going to have to have another discussion because that $8.60 uh, $8 will be a, becoming a reality. So we'll have to have a whole other discussion about the affordability of the project. Joe, just one other option would be the federal government has a significant infrastructure program that would impact this project. And that would be fantastic. That would draw the lines down. down. Right. right. Absolutely. So for the purposes of going forward uh, to compare the integrated plan versus the current plan, we're using the $6.20 number, which is the feasible when you could actually complete the North Tunnel Plan by 2032. So these are the key assumptions as we go into the affordability analysis. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on these. They're obviously, if you're projecting out for you know, 20, 30, 40 years, you have to make assumptions on inflation. You have to make assumptions on bonding. You have to make assumptions on operation and maintenance. And this is all the things that went in, uh, coordinated with MDC, uh, into the affordability analysis for those type of assumptions. Basically, um, MDC customers, as you all know, pay for sewer in two primary ways. Ad valorem and the clean water charge. So an ad valorem is the, obviously the, the, the paid directly through to the town through the tax bill. The clean water charge is based on metered water on the water bill. To address the EPA affordability process, we need to combine both of those on a per dwelling unit. This slide basically talks about how you make the chocolate cake with the ad valorem and getting it down to a per dwelling. So, Basically, we had to go through the analysis of taking your tax bill or the Avalon charge that's going out to each individual town, say Hartford, divide that by the number of dwelling units in Hartford, and then come up with a per dwelling cost for each of the dwellings in Hartford. We did that for each of the towns. So each of the towns you see on the left, the second column is the portion of Avalon that is going that would go to the towns in 2019 uh, that would be that was projected. Third column is the number of dwelling units uh, from census data. And then the fourth column just stri strictly gets that down to the Avalorum bill to the uh, per dwelling. Uh, you see it ranges from $140 uh, per dwelling in Hartford all the way up to as high as $383 in West Hartford. This is the clean water project charge side of the equation. So on the top of the table, on the top of the slide, you see uh, the table uh, that shows the currently approved long-term control plan by 2029. There's the 530. Then you see the more realistic schedule, 620 by, uh, by uh, uh, if we complete it in 2032. So on the bottom side, it's taking each of the towns, and we're looking at the median household uh, income from census data. The last census data was from 2016. We then looked backwards to 2009 to look at how much the average annual increase was by town. So each of these differ by town. And then estimated what 2019 would be to come up with the average annual increase by town. So in the past, when we did this analysis, uh, this is another key difference between 2014 and today. In the past, we had just used a straight, I believe, 2.5% uh, 
increase in annual uh, income. And clearly it's different. Uh, it actually ranges as high as, what, 2.26% in, in Newington to as low as 0.56% in Bloomfield using, using this actual data in this way. So this slide is looking at the actual consumption of water per dwelling. So we went through the data. The left-hand side, and this is by town, so the left-hand side is what we had assumed in 2014. We had assumed that each house was on average using 105 CCF, which equates to approximately 80,000 gallons a year. The column right next to that is the estimated surcharge bill based on that, which we had estimated would be $430, given the current charge in 2019 that's projected at $4.10. The next column is the actual water consumption, which we did not have that data back in 2014. We went through a significant, the MDC went through a significant effort to, to, find, to try to estimate what that consumption was, and it's much lower than we had assumed. And obviously we know that has to do with water conservation. So lower consumption means that the average surcharge bill to those homes is less than we had projected back in 2014. So for, uh, for Hartford, for instance, it goes from $430, what we projected, to $319 is the actual. A, more, uh, a, a larger difference would be, say, Bloomfield, which has the lowest amount of water uh, that's estimated to be actually used. It goes from $430, um, um, based on $105, to $249, based on the actual. So this... Uh, slide then takes both of those bills and stacks them on top of each other by town. So the green bars are the amount that the uh, average dwelling unit in each town pays towards Avalorum, and the blue bar on top is the amount that's played, paid through the clean water project charge to get the total of what the sewer bill is uh, uh, by town. And then you can see, uh, I actually can't read that from here, but you can see it ranges, uh, Hartford is the low, uh, I think it's like 450 to West Hartford is the high. Um, to answer a question uh, that was asked earlier today, where the sewer uh, customer charge uh, resides in this, it's not, it's not that it's not in here. Where it resides is in the green bar in the Avalorum. So it has been included. It's just captured in the Avalorum green bar. So next we look at the, uh, the actual household burden. Now that we have all those parts of the equations, we have what the total bill is by town. We have what the median household income is. So now we look at what the burden is on median household percentage that's projected for 2019. And that's the column on the far right-hand side. And so you see that Hartford uh, is the highest burdened uh, city, and it peaks, or it would be in 2019, it'd be 1.35%. That clearly is a lot lower than the 2% that we had projected about four years ago for the reasons uh, that I'd stated. Um, just to recap on those again, water sales are down, uh, water sales are, are at the 16.1 million CCF, but the household is running at 70 CCF, significantly lower than what we had assumed in the past. Uh, the incomes that we had assumed at 2.5% annually were actually less than that in many cases. And so as a result, the median household income uh, burden is lower than we had projected that it would be. Um, this is just comparing the median household income estimates that we used in 2014 to what we have in 2018. Uh, I'm not going to go through these in detail. You have the slide uh, in front of you. Again, this is what we had projected in 2014. We're now, Hartford is that line uh, up at the top showing it over, we were projecting to be just over 2%. It's actually closer to 1.35% for 2019. So now we're going to evaluate the pending alternatives. Um, before we get into that, as, as uh, Mr. Jellison had mentioned earlier, we're looking at a shift from projects that would have in the past went towards Avalorum that now would be on the clean water project charge. And these are those projects that achieve a dual benefit of rehabilitating the existing sewer system while also reducing combined sewer overflow and uh, uh, SSOs. The pictures on the bottom uh, are not uh, stock pictures off the web. That is your actual sewer system. Um, I asked uh, uh, someone who is working in this a lot, and I told him, give me three good pictures. I don't, and those are all three of them are pretty scary. So that's what we're talking about trying to address. You have a number of that throughout your system, and that's what we're looking to do, is to do the rehabilitation, uh, in some cases point repairs or pipe replacement, and follow that up with, uh, with a liner inside the pipe. 
So these are the three scenarios that we looked at uh, for the affordability analysis. Scenario one is the if you continued on your current path, completed the plan the, with the North Tunnel by 2032, um, the Avalorum would stay as it is. There'd be $37 million a year escalated uh, for sewer rehab, uh, for sewer repairs, and that's basically what we're comparing the, the integrated plan against. Scenario two lists out all of the infrastructure projects that were rated out, both CSO and non-CSO, uh, as long as they were in, you know, addressing um, um, the consent order or the consent decree, and looked at doing those projects over a 40-year time period. The CIP uh, that goes towards Avalorum would be reduced from 37 million to 15 million, um, and basically uh, everything else stays the same for assumptions. Scenario three was doing exactly the same thing on the Avalorum side, but doing the clean water project on a 30-year uh, schedule. So those are, these, those are the three lines on this slide here. The green line, which is the one that you see that goes uh, up higher, is the scenario one, which is the, real, uh, the current plan uh, with the tunnel. And then the, uh, the other two, scenario two, is the 40-year plan, and scenario three is the 30-year integrated plan. Um, so I look at these and say they're all about the same. If anything, scenario one is a little, is obviously worse in, in uh, you know, 15 to 25 years out, but they're uh, generally uh, pretty consistent following each other. So for the purposes of going forward, we've just compared scenario one to scenario two, the 40-year plan. So on a household burden, um, looking at MDC as an average, again, what, what EPA would be looking at is 2%, but looking at MDC as an average, um, we looked at the household burden between the current plan versus the proposed plan, and you see, again, they look very similar. Uh, it peaks out at just over... Uh, 1.1%. Uh, it peaks out at just over 1.1% with the, with the blue line, which is the scenario two over 40 years. Uh, and then obviously it's a little bit higher with scenario one with continuing on the current plan. And this is the, uh, the grand finale slide that basically shows that the, um, on the left-hand side, so each of these are in five-year increments. So if you work the two bars, they start in, uh, I think, 2020, and then 2025, and 2030, and so on. What you're looking at on the left-hand side is scenario one, Avalorum again, the green bar, with the clean water project charge stacked on top of it, and scenario two is on the right-hand side each time, again, with Avalorum and the clean water project charge. Uh, as you can see, as you go forward with scenario one, you see the amount of green bars increasing uh, you know, dramatically. That's if you stayed with your current plan and you were doing that $37 million on the Avalorum side. Uh, that's how much the green bar would go up over time. What we're looking to do is to shift those projects over the clean water project charge, address the infrastructure at the same time. In scenario two, you see that the green bar does not go up nearly as high, but the blue bars for the clean water project charge do start to get taller. But at the end result, as you look at the five-year increment, it's, pay, it's roughly the same amount to the, uh, to the property owner. Um, in fact, uh, scenario two is actually a little bit cheaper in each case uh, compared to scenario one. So, Shifting the burden from Avalorum to the clean water charge, addressing the sewer infrastructure, and at the same time, the homeowner that's paying the, the either through Avalorum or through the clean water project charge, they're paying the same amount through either program. So my next, my last slide is just the upcoming schedule. But I think I, I think we should probably do that at the end, or I don't know if you want to go through that now. Um, so. Just, uh, just the upcoming uh, schedule for, uh, um, for this is obviously we're here tonight and presenting the affordability analysis. We've already done the, the project list. Um, if, if, uh, if the board uh, sees this plan as something to move forward with, we would proceed with town council uh, meetings over the next two months. Four of them have been scheduled. There's four others that are in the works to be scheduled. Um, initial draft of the report would be submitted this month to MDC. Final draft would be submitted in November. And then an anticipated public hearing would be in early December, probably December 11th or 12th. And then all three volumes would be submitted to DEP by the end of the year. Uh, Joe, I just want to make one point. And uh, as we, we have had numerous discussions with DEEP uh, over the last year, as Joe mentioned, we, we basically told them almost two years ago that we're not proceeding with the North Tunnel <coughs> as proposed. 
and we're going to propose an integrated plan, um, we would expect a similar time frame of approval. It was two years last time, 2012 to 2014. But the reason why we're proposing a 40-year plan is <clears throat> you can't do an integrated process quickly. And the example of trying to do separation quickly is what we did on Albany Avenue and on Franklin Avenue. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to avoid, um, you can do separation, you can do it correctly, but you have to take your time doing it. And so we're proposing, that's why the integrated plan is, is pushing the remaining portion of what we refer to as the North Tunnel, we now call the Downtown Tunnel. We're pushing that. We don't want to even start that project until the debt service on the tunnel we're building today is paid off in 2038. So that's why it helps us. Um, but in terms of the separation of the areas in the northern part of the city, lessons learned, we need to do that slowly, methodically in smaller projects and, and because otherwise the impacts to the businesses and residents will be the same result as what happened uh, in Probably 2008 through 2012 especially when we start doing it downtown. Um, questions? Uh, Don, and we'll uh, go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not a question, but Joe, I just want to congratulate you and your team. I think this is, is uh, it may be the, the, the best concise report presented to this body that I've seen. Uh, easy to read, easy to understand and just chock full of, of good information, so thank you. Thank you very much. Obviously, uh, we don't do it alone. There's lots of people at MDC that are, work on this every day as well in the engineering department. Thank you. Rich? Yeah. This plan was presented last week in front of the Board of Public Works, and it passed unanimously. Denise? Um, just because we've also uh, been talking about the ad valorem tax in general, and we have an analysis taking place since there's a lot of talk about how this is going to be split between ad valorem and, and the water bill. Could we just update where we are with that discussion and how that would impact we're this still, plan? We're still doing, we're getting information on that. Um, and what, by yep. the next. Yeah, so we, um, so this plan, this integrated component is one of the options that they're looking at, as well as the option of simply getting rid of Avalorum uh, and going to a sewage user charge. We just had a meeting uh, last week, update, uh, John? Yeah, we had a phone call with the towns a couple weeks ago, and during that call, I mean, we needed to in incorporate the integrated plan as one uh, possibility, and another possibility came up. And so the contract, the uh, consultant, that was outside the scope of our original agreement. They came back with a proposed amendment. With, so for an additional $9,000, they're going to do the other uh, scenarios. So we're going to sign that, and then we'll need to give them more information. And then the, the report, we already reviewed a draft final report, but with these additional scenarios put in, um, I think in, in a month time period. Is, is Aren't we also complicating this a little with the uh, bond responsibilities? Yeah. So there's a lot more information, uh, but it's being concentrated so we can move forward because there's bonds that are out. And ultimately, whatever we do, uh, if we go from ad valorem to user charge, it will require the legislature's approval. And once we do this, we'll not be able to go back again. Right. So there's, a, there's more information being assembled, hopefully, in the next couple of the next month or so. Thank Andy? You. Would there be any difference from a standpoint of federal funds, like from the clean, by switching more responsibility over to the Clean Water Project? We won't, we, there isn't a lot of federal money out there. Yeah, there's only about 15% of federal money in the state's clean water program. Uh, no, as long as, and that's why it's important to get DEEP's approval on this. So as long as DEEP agrees that a, and I'll use Homestead Avenue as an example, used it in the past. It's an existing piece of pipe, 24-inch, uh, that is falling apart. We're proposing to not only replace it, but use it to comply with their consent order on CSOs for the North Branch of the Park River. So if they agree to this program, then their pro the replacement of that pipe would be part of the funding 
uh, that we would expect uh, from the state, which is 48 percent uh, grant loan. So that specific part. And r right. So if we don't do that, that that pipe will have to be replaced someday, and that pipe will be paid for by the towns and by Avalorman. That's why. That's why the the last slide that Joe has is at the end of the day. Either Avalorans <laughs> paying for it or the Clean Water Project, but at the end, the cost of the customer is the same. Um, so that that is the the challenge we're trying to balance is, is is to replace use the money we have to replace old pipes that need to be replaced. And, and hopefully, and I think this <coughs> necessity, the federal government's going to have to get back in this business for infrastructure in general. They're already talking about a massive infrastructure program. The longer this gets stretched out, the more f opportunity the federal money to can involve itself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> and then, uh, we we also um, um, met uh, at the end of last week uh, to talk about this. The the the, uh, the committee that we have is is meeting with the consultants that are doing pro you know providing us with some di different options of what it would look like if we change things to one way or another at this point we're up to like about seven or eight options I think uh, but um, you know we're, what we started to look at was was to find a way to uh, move the sewer user charges to the water bill the way other towns have water bills do but that was it was not to eliminate the ad valorem I don't, it, it, if the total amount of the ad valorem only about, John, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, only about 16 million of that is associated with sewer user charges. The rest is, is uh, capital improvements, paying down debt service and so forth, but only about 16 million of that is, is actual sewer user costs. So uh, at least that's what I got out of it. So um, is one of the options to, to eliminate the ad valorem altogether? And I, I think you heard the chairman say that uh, if you do that, you can't go back, but uh, um, I can't imagine that that would be an option that would, that would work for anyone because then the entire cost of the MDC would be on the water bill. And we just saw that you can't go over 2% uh, in the affordability options on it. You can't go over 2% and uh, we're already at 1.35% or something for Hartford. So uh, um, I'm not sure that all of that works out in the future, but Certainly, there'll be a plan that does move move stuff around. So, uh, but I, I I don't want anybody here to think that we're trying to decide to have an ad valorem or not. That's not really what we're doing. We have uh, like seven or eight different options on how to um, uh, address the charges for both operating costs and capital improvement costs. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, Jerry, one clarification. I'm sorry. Um, the household burden on the slide is for the I MDC know. as an average. The city of Hartford, it's if we just looked at the city of Hartford, it approaches 2%. Yeah, that, that's what I was right. trying to suggest. Just want to clarify that. Right. It's there now right. for all intents and purposes. <clears throat> Gary? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're really depending on the state here, but 48% of certain costs. And I, my question is, uh, given the fiscal situation that the state is in, how ironclad is that? In terms of <laughs> it's as ironclad as the adoption of the budget every year. <laughs> <laughs> There's a surplus now. Everything's fine. Uh, the, the affordability calculation, which uh, EPA sets the guidelines, and it is just a guideline of 2%. But um, we, uh, as a utility and, and all utilities across the country, believe that not only should you consider uh, the Avalorm charge or the sewer user charge and the clean water charge under the calculation. We strongly believe that the same customers are paying for the water. And the water and the stormwater and the MS4 and all those things are not, quote, part of this calculation to get to 2%. The MDC, like many other utilities, we have um, 1,500 miles of water main. And we've talked about the water, water issues all the time. So that's, a, that's real. That's a real cost to our customers. We have a real decision to make over the next uh, five years. Do we spend $500 million improving the West Hartford filter plant? I mean, these are real things that, uh, although EPA uh, DEEP may not consider as part of the affordability, it, it's a reality for our customers. Gather all that. My, my question is, what if, what if DEEP does not come through? 
What we got it, you, the top line you saw up there at eight sixty. That's where you are. Right. That's we have to have with no no subsidy in the long term, right? Right. The, the line that's we correct eight sixty. We have to have a, obviously a referendum uh, to move forward with the project. So uh, the plan would be is if we do get approval from the board and we do submit to deep. Um, by the 31st and they approve that document um, at some point within the the near uh, future within a year or so we're going to need to go to referendum um, so without referendum approval we're kind of back at square one um, so we have you know challenges financial challenges we're gonna have to overcome when we did the referendum in 2012 um, we had overwhelming support, as everyone knows, but the the water bill had not really started to see the significant um, increases until 2013. So, as we now know, most of us get phone calls, you know, to to say, "Oh my God, my water bill has doubled," and it's associated with the clean water project surcharge. Well, there's also going to have to be, in my opinion, help from the federal government <coughs> if we can avoid a few wars we can probably get back into that swing. But, um, you know, there's going to be pressure on everybody, especially even at the federal level. We're approaching almost a match to our grand national product is our debt. So there's a whole lot of other issues on the table. by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, item 12, consideration and poten potential action authorization to auction district vehicles. Is there a motion to adopt? <coughs> so moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Don? Mr. Chairman, could, could we be provided, the commissioner be provided with a list of, of vehicles that are planning on being auctioned off? Before your, you vote or after no, you vote? Sometime after you vote. Before the okay. takes place. No problem. If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Item 13, referral to the Water Bureau regarding Kimberly Lane Water Association petition for the water service. Recommended action, receive the report and adopt the resolution. No approval. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, going back to uh, item number six, district chairman's report, um, to, to discuss uh, the... Chairman, do we want to do the uh, public comments? I understand. Comments? We're going to go to... What's that? We want to do the public comments so that people can leave. Okay. Sure. Let me do that. Opportunity for general public comments. Everybody left. <laughs> oh, Judy's still here. Judy's still here. Judy's still here. Yeah, but she left. She's not coming back to the podium. That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, if not, uh, the proper motion to go into executive session on item uh, number six, the district chairman's report deals with the with the negotiations. It's been pending negotiations. It is uh, moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. 
uh, before I ask the post, who do we want to stay in the? I'm not committed because we're uh, not Chris. Chris. Me, John. Chris Louder. Sunagrelli. Myself, John Myrtle, Chris Levesque, Sunagrelli, and uh, John Sunagrelli. Okay. Any further? Yes. Yeah. Any further discussion? Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, could we have an executive session, please? Camera's got to be off. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any further comments? If not, um, uh, is there a motion? If not, uh, all those in favor, without objection, we stand adjourned.